What's up guys, Eber here with Hurricane X and welcome back to another video. Uh, AMD's Ryzen Threadripper 1950X, this is their top of the line uh, CPU, costs a thousand dollars. And I'm pretty sure most of you might be reluctant to spend that kind of money on a processor unless if you're not power hungry for 16 cores. You know, I thought to myself, now that Ryzen 3 is an excellent option for people who are just looking to casually game at 1080p, uh, why not build a system, a compact based system for the same amount as the 1950X, so $1,000. So I did that, and here's what it looks like. But before we move on to the parts list and the benchmarks, and of course my experience with the build, uh, here's a quick message from our sponsor. It's time to try something new with the K900M mechanical keyboard by Zalman with kale brown switches, onboard macro recordings and absolutely gorgeous RGB illumination with the white frame. Even your dog will go nuts. Check it out in the description below. If you're looking for more information on the new Ryzen 3 CPUs, uh, aka the new 1300X and the 1200, uh, we'll leave a link to our performance review video as well as a written article that's on our website in the description down below. Let's kick things off with the CPU that's going inside this build, the Ryzen 3 1300X. It's a quad-core, quad-threaded processor priced at $130 and it offers the best bang for your buck. For one, it's got a base clock of 3.5 GHz and a boost of up to 3.7, and you can easily overclock this thing to 4 GHz no problem, and we'll talk about that momentarily. AMD does include a Wraith Stealth CPU cooler to complement this chip, and that's what we'll be using to cool the 1300X. I didn't go for an aftermarket solution simply because I was strictly on a budget of about $1,100, and this is including the operating system, uh, plus, it's actually a great way to test how well the stock cooler could handle overclocking uh, inside a compact case. Housing the CPU and cooler is the Gigabyte AB350N Gaming Wi-Fi ITX motherboard. It's priced at $150 and it's actually one of our first ITX based B350 boards that we've taken a look at. I mean, we did get a little glance at it back at Computex and a lot of you guys were interested to see how well this would fit inside a compact system, so here it is. Now the board is pretty much packed with features like built-in RGB lighting and NVMe M.2 slot at the back that you could seriously take advantage of if you're into fast storage. The dual channel memory modules can support up to 32 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. There are two USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type A ports at the rear I.O. for faster storage expansion. You also get Intel's 802.11 dual band Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.0, which is awesome. But there is a huge caveat that you should be aware of. Here, take a closer look at this board for instance. Notice anything weird about the connector layout? Now, first time builders might not recognize it right away, but having built numerous systems for the channel, I found the placement of the 24 pin connector, the USB 3.1 header, SATA ports, front panel power and reset pins, and even the four pin CPU connector a bit odd. Now, traditional ATX or even micro ATX motherboards have these connectors sh shifted 90 degrees, meaning the CPU 4 pin would be placed at the top, the 24 pin along with the USB 3.1 header and SATA ports are located right beside the memory modules and the rest at the bottom. In fact, many cases have been designed to properly route cables to these connectors for a more simple and cleaner look. This Gigabyte board will definitely give you a tough time with cable management, so be well prepared. For memory, I chose G-Skills Ribjoss 16GB DDR4 kit clocked at 2400MHz. Now, memory prices have increased quite a lot since the last time I built a mini ITX PC. We're talking a $30 increase for the exact same RAM kit. So now we're looking at around $130. That's a huge jump in price, guys. Needless to say, this should be a pretty good option for gaming as we've conducted multiple tests comparing 16 versus 32 versus 64. So if you're interested in that comparison, I'll leave a link to that video in the description down below. As for the case, Silverstone hooked us up with their new RVZ03 slim form factor chassis. If you recall their Raven series of cases, this is their third iteration to that lineup, and they've included a cool feature this time. Built-in RGB lighting, my friends. It's a great implementation in my opinion because you can color match it to the rest of your setup, and as a bonus, uh, the Gigabyte board comes with a 4-pin RGB header, so lighting controls can be done through Gigabyte's Fusion software, although be prepared to justify its $110 price tag. From a physical standpoint, nothing much has changed from the previous RVZ02 case that Dimitri reviewed a while back, other than the front panel design shift. The interior is sporting the same layout, 
but Silverstone decided to eliminate support for a 3.5 inch hard drive and I found that to be really odd, which brings me to my next point, storage. I chose the OCZ TL100 240GB SSD as my primary boot drive and for my most used applications. To expand the game library, I had to take the hit for slower RPMs because A, I was on a strict budget and B, 2.5 inch hard drives was the only option to go with since this case lacks support for a 3.5 inch hard drive. So I decided to go with Seagate's 1TB 5400 RPM 2.5 inch hard drive. Now expect longer game load times when you go for a hard drive that's spec'd at 5400 RPM. Uh, but there are a few alternative solutions that you could opt for. One is that you could eliminate the dual drive setup and go for an all-in-one solution, so like a high capacity SSD that can host your operating system and your game library. But again, take into account that higher capacity SSDs are still ridiculously expensive, so you can definitely go over the $1,100 budget. The other option is to go for Silverstone's RVZO2 case because that case comes with support for a 3.5 inch hard drive. But the downside to that case is that it does not come with RGB lighting, so if that's not a deal breaker to you, then by all means. Now onto the best part of the build, the GPU. And this was a tough choice. I picked the EVGA GTX 1060 Superclock video card simply because it was the least expensive bang for your buck solution but it also happened to be readily available, which can't be set for many graphics cards these days. Now, I'm completely aware of the mining situation where gamers have to pay a lot more for GPUs than what they would normally do uh, due to demand, and in some cases, it's even hard to find GPUs in stock uh, in online stores or even local stores. It's a huge crisis point for gamers. I'm not sure how to address this issue, or I'm not sure how companies are going to address this problem, but um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Uh, where is mining going to go and how is that going to affect gamers? Looking forward to the responses. Powering the whole system is the Silverstone ST45SF small form factor PSU with an 80 plus bronze certification and it retails for about $60. There should be plenty enough to power the 1300X and the GTX 1060 plus it's also super quiet during idle and load operations. So here's the final build. I think it turned out pretty well. I mean, from a physical standpoint, the only thing that shines through this PC is that RGB lighting at the front. It's very subtle and I love the way how it looks. Like I mentioned before, lighting can be controlled through the Gigabytes Fusion app and there are different effects that users can pick. You can go all out if you so desire. However, I'm not that happy with the cable management inside the chassis. It's just a mess, guys, and I tried my best to make it look nicer, but the layout on the motherboard was just too hard to overcome. It's one of the downsides if you're planning to go mini ITX, so be aware of the compromises. Silverstone has included magnetic dust filters and a couple of 120mm slim fans for good airflow, so that's welcoming to see on a $110 chassis. So here's a closer look at the parts list for the build along with the operating system. The total price rounds up to about $1,100 without any sales taken into account, but there are a few things that I need to mention. The inclusion of the operating system is important since Windows 10 Home eats up $120 of our budget that could have been spent on other things. If you already have a Windows license, then I'd suggest putting that money towards an aftermarket cooler and maybe a GPU upgrade, or even step things up to a Ryzen 5 1600 CPU. Another thing to point out is that I'm actually using average retail prices for every components rather than some vague suggested retail price. With that being said, it is crazy to see how component prices have shot up in the last few months. Uh, just take the SSD, the memory, and the GPU into account. Um, this bill cost me $200 more than what it would have been back in May. So let's switch gears and talk about overclocking because I had a very interesting experience with the 1300X, the stock cooler, and the Gigabyte B350 motherboard. Um, so I started with four gigahertz. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do, or I wasn't able to get a full successful boot uh, with that setting. And then I toned it down to 3.9. I ran Cinebench multi-core and the three mark fire strike test got a significantly higher score than the stock settings. So that was awesome. But I ran the Premiere Pro 4K render test and the system just crashed about halfway through rendering that video. Then I toned down the settings to 3.8 and I ran the Cinebench multi-core test along with the fire strike test. I got a slightly lower score than what I got with the 3.9 gigahertz overclock. Uh, but surprisingly, I ran the Premiere Pro render test and it passed no problem. The last thing I did to ensure stability at 3.8 gigahertz was to run the IDA64 stress test. And disappointingly, or I guess the sad news was that uh, the system crashed about 30 minutes into the test 
and uh, I rebooted the system, opened up IDA and noticed that the CPU temperatures got at 95C, it almost reached 95C. So I guess the CPU cooler was the bottleneck uh, with this overclock. So ultimately I left the settings at stock and I just ran the benchmarks. So here are the results. Cinebench R15 in the multi-core test dished out around 544 points, whereas OpenGL scored roughly 81 frames per second. Our standard one minute 4K video using Premiere Pro CC 2017 took three minutes and 10 seconds to complete. And as you can see, that's how well it did compared to my previous builds and my workstation PC. This isn't geared towards content creators, although you're more than welcome to upgrade to Ryzen 5 or even Ryzen 7 down the road, provided you figured out the cooling situation. CPU temperatures were respectable. Out of the box, the 1300X ran about 36C during idle and under load, it was reaching about 66 degrees. Not bad for a stock cooler actually. Now on to gaming, Battlefield 1 at 1080p set to high averaged around 83 frames per second, Overwatch at 1080p set to ultra averaged well over 150 frames per second, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon which is a slightly more demanding title taxed out on the GTX 1060 at 1080p set to high settings, it was averaging just a tad above 60 frames per second. Finally Doom at 1080p set to ultra did really well averaging around 100 frames per second, so overall, you're looking at a really capable gaming PC for 1080p gaming, and in some cases, you could push it to 1440p, but be mindful of the settings. The GTX 1060 Superclock was idling around 48C, and during gaming, it reached a max of 74 degrees Celsius. It's not too bad for a GPU of this size, and surprisingly, the core speed went all the way up to 1962 megahertz, and this was during the Ghost Recon benchmark. Say goodbye to cables, it's time to enjoy wireless audio with the Corsair Void RGB gaming headset with a light and comfortable frame, low profile mic, on headset volume control and mic mute plus dual side illumination. Check out the Void RGB by Corsair, the perfect way to hear your game. Well there you have it guys, a mini ITX Ryzen PC for $1100. I know a lot of you guys might not agree with my component selections here, but uh, again, I'd like to hear your thoughts on alternatives. For example, the CPU or the stock cooler didn't really make any sense uh, for the budget, but uh, one of the downsides to going mini ITX is that the cost obviously increases. For example, the case would get expensive. Uh, mini ITX motherboards are also expensive. So again, that's one of the factors that you'll have to take into consideration. But nonetheless, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the performance that I was able to get out of this PC. Also, stay tuned for more builds uh, featuring X399, perhaps X299. I really don't know, but um, the rest of 2017 looks really promising. So I'm just gonna leave it there. I'm Ebro with Hurricane X. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe for more similar content, and we'll see you in the next one.